Pamela. Hello, friends. I was going to talk about whales, but I changed my mind. Now I'm going to talk about architecture. I seem to constantly find myself surprised in middle age, which is a good condition for a writer to be in. When I was asked to talk about art for this event, I surprised myself by saying yes. And then I started to worry because what do I know about art? I know about writing and my books and essays and stories qualify as literature, but art with a capital A can feel like it belongs to other people, experts, painters and sculptors and musicians, people with degrees in art history, people who can spell the word renaissance. <laughs> I could write a book, I thought, on what I don't know about art, The US novelist Jane Smiley has said that every novel begins with the same premise. Things are not what they seem. And this idea, which taken to its logical conclusion is quite the recipe for paranoia, struck me very hard when I first read it. Of course, things very often aren't what they seem, which then begs the question, and there you have it, the beginning of your novel or your play your installation or your film. To imagine that things are not what they seem means to step beyond the conventional. And that's extremely difficult to do without something like breakfast in your belly and a roof over your head. Traditionally, the player of the Yiraki in Yolnu culture of Northeast Arnhem Land was privileged as a musician. He was a specialist and others provided for his family. But in the West today, part of the function of arts is to criticise and castigate the powerful. The artist frequently bites the hand that feeds her. And this bite might be corrective or homeopathic or cauterising, an essential service to the body politic. But essential or not, bites hurt. Little wonder that self-serving governments seek to shut artists down. And the more corrupt the government, the less interested it will be in funding critique expressed in literature or music or public installations or film. I was thinking about this public funding of art and I was amazed. I was riveted by this fact that I came across recently that Sir Christopher Wren, the renowned English architect who rebuilt London's churches after the Great Fire of 1666, once went unpaid for 14 years. 14 years! The English Parliament withheld half his salary to try and speed up the completion of St Paul's <laughs> Cathedral. And meanwhile, he was busy building other edifices for kings and nobles. When he died, Wren was buried in the crypt of his magnum opus. His son had inscribed on his tombstone the legend, Reader, if you seek his monument, look around you. And those same words are repeated in black marble immediately below that famous dome in central London. Reader, if you seek his monument, look around you. Very moving. Wren was one of the instigators of the English Royal Society, which means that three and a half centuries ago, he and some of his contemporaries formed an association for the better understanding of, the natural, of natural history. They wanted to closely examine the world that they were living in and put resources into that quest. Aboriginal peoples had been doing exactly this for tens of thousands of years. And we formalised our knowledge in continental bodies of art. But better late than never, I suppose. <laughs> when Cook sailed to our east coast, part of the rationale for that voyage was the gaining of scientific knowledge. It would have been beyond his comprehension or the comprehension of Wren or of any European at the time to think that many kinds of science and art were far more sophisticated here than anywhere they called home. But then things are not always what they seem. 
St Paul's Cathedral still stands literally a monument to Wren's genius and the willingness of the English Parliament to supply public funds to build it. Alas, to quote the Wiradjuri poet and intellectual Uncle Kevin Gilbert, when the English arrived here, we were confronted by barbarism, a people who never comprehended that there could be cathedrals of the spirit as well as of stone. Cathedrals of the spirit. What Kevin Gilbert referred to was a continent-wide paradigm, an unimaginably vast and complex web of story and song, which developed here over 100,000 years of human society. The British came to our beloved estates and saw hostile wilderness. We know our countries as an enormous complex of sacred song lines. Our Jali Jali Billa, the weeping she-oak trees, which in some parts of Guri literature are interpreted as beautiful young maidens, or in the season of their flowering in far northern Australia as young warriors dressed in red ochre, were described by the colonist Rosa Prayed as old hags. The bottlenose dolphin was to colonial eyes not the Yugambe ancestor Gawanda, nor the warrior who created the red soil of the Kwandamuka mainland, but rather a hideous monster. Two centuries after the arrival of such barbarous thinking, the poet Anya Walwitz excoriated the society that grew out of it in her wonderful poem, Australia. Like David Malouf in Jono, she effectively described a place in which poetry could never occur. Her poem begins, I won't read the whole poem, but it begins, you big ugly, you too empty, you desert with your nothing, 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 you scorched suntanned, old too quickly, acres of suburbs watching the telly, you bore me, you nothing much with your big sea, beach, beach, beach. You big, so what? I'm small, it's what's in. You silent on Sunday, nobody on your streets. You dead at night, you go to sleep too early. You scare me with your hopeless. Hard to imagine a more scathing view of 20th century Australia. Anna Walwitz nailed it. But ironically, an immigrant, she also failed to see what Cook and Oxley and every other conquistador was oblivious to. Intellectual beauty and poetry and song have been here for tens of thousands of years and survive today. Desert country is very far from nothing, nothing, nothing. It hums with meaning and power to its first people. Art is everywhere in Australia and we, her indigenes, have imbued every part of our continent with literature. Metaphor is literally an entire art form with us. Every valley and hill in Australia is a storied place. Every path and mountain top and plain and watercourse has a name and belongs to the giant continental literature called by outsiders the song lines. Art is everywhere, but remains stubbornly resistant to the mainstream gaze. John Oxley rode up the Warra in 1823 and looked upon Magunjan, but didn't know he travelled in the track of the great Gabul, and he sailed blithely past the evidence of its moral struggle with Marung when he crossed the river bar. Cook recorded seeing pine and cedar and many smokes on the, west, on the east coast, but he saw nothing he called art or philosophy. He was here for resources, not ideas. Things are not what they seem. Our art is everywhere on this continent. It has been everywhere Australians look or step or breathe or love for millennia. If you would seek our monuments, look around you. We'll go back.